Okay, so welcome to the first lecture of week 10. And so far in chapter 3, we have learned what's meant by a function being continuous at a point C in its domain. And the domain is an interval I. And we also saw what's meant by a function being continuous on the whole interval. And then we learned a characterization theorem which describes continuity in terms of convergence of sequences. The function is continuous at a point C in its domain if and only if for every sequence in its domain such that Xn converges to C, you have that f of Xn converges to f of C. And then we learned a result about the algebra of continuous functions which roughly speaking says that uh, if you algebraically combine continuous functions then the result is again a continuous function. So for example, the pointwise sum or the pointwise product of continuous functions is again continuous. Then we also saw that the restriction of a continuous function to a subinterval is again continuous and the composition of continuous functions if it is defined then it's also continuous. So only two last topics are remaining in this chapter which are further properties of continuous functions. One is called the intermediate value theorem which we will discuss today and next time we will discuss uh, something known as the extreme value theorem. And both of these theorems deal with continuous functions on a compact interval. Uh, so a bounded interval in which the endpoints are included. And intermediate value theorem says that whatever is the endpoint values at A and B, okay, so FA and FB, maybe FA is bigger than FB. And if I take any intermediate value between FA and FB, so I think of a Y, then that is attained. So there must be some C uh, in AB such that F of C is equal to Y. And in fact, here you see there's more than one. Also, there is another point over here says that F of that thing is equal to Y. And the extreme value theorem says that if I look at all the F of X's where X belongs to AB, then that set that you get, that's a bounded set. Moreover, it's non-empty. So it has a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound. And in fact, these two are attained. So they are again something in the range. In other words, there exists a C such that F of C is this supremum and F of D is this infimum. And so in other words, a function on a compact interval uh, and if the function is continuous, then it possesses a maximizer and a minimizer. Okay, so that we will uh, discuss next time, but today we will uh, deal with the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so here is the rough statement of the intermediate value theorem. Suppose that f is a real valued continuous function living on a compact interval a, b. So maybe the value at a is f a, which is lower than the value at b, which is f b. Then this intermediate value theorem says that f assumes every value between F A and F B. So no matter which Y I take in between F A and F B, so in this vertical line segment between F A and F B, and we draw a horizontal line through there, then it has to intersect the graph at some point. In fact, here you see that there are multiple points where it intersects. And what this means is that there is some C in here such that F of C is exactly uh, equal to Y. So of course this needn't happen with a function which is not continuous. For example, here is a function which I've drawn which is clearly not continuous at this point in its domain because at this point there is a jump. Okay, And here is what FA is and here is what FB is. So if I take some value in between FA and FB, it can happen that that's not attained. Of course, if I take the value over here, then it is attained. But if I take, for example, this value Y, indicated uh, in orange over here and if you draw a horizontal line through it then we see that it misses out on uh, intersecting the graph of the function. In other words this value y is never attained at any point in its domain. So clearly this intermediate value property or theorem is valid for continuous functions and it may not hold for functions which are not continuous and sort of it's an intuitively very clear result but that's not a proof so we will have to prove this carefully and we'll see that we need to use the least upper bound property of the real numbers. So here is the precise statement of the intermediate value theorem. It says that if a and b are two real numbers and a is strictly less than b and f is a real valued 
continuous function on this compact interval a b then the following holds that if y is any real number lying in between these two endpoint values fa and fp so if fa is less than or equal to fp then y is bigger than or equal to fa and less than or equal to fp and if fb is less than or equal to fa then y is less than or equal to fa and bigger than or equal to fp so if you take any such real number lying in between fa and fp then the intermediate value theorem says that this value is attained so there exists a c in the domain in this compact interval such that f of c is equal to y so any value in between fa and fb actually also belongs to the range of the function okay so sort of pictorially here is a which is strictly less than b and the function is defined on this compact interval a b this continuous function and in this picture i have shown that fa is strictly bigger than fb and then the intermediate value theorem says that if i take any y in between over here that also belongs to the range so there must be some c such that f of c is equal to the y so for example if the y were here and if i draw a horizontal line through here it intersects the graph here so we see that you know if you go down over here there is some point such that the f of that point is exactly this value similarly if the y is over here in between fa and fb i take it over here then again i draw a horizontal line it intersects the graph here so we read off that okay there is a point over here such that f of that point is this value but of course there might be more than one place where uh, the value is attained so for example if y is this value over here if i draw this horizontal line then it intersects the graph at several places and each of these yellow points in the domain the f of that is equal to this y okay so the theorem doesn't tell you how many there are for a given y it just says that there exists at least one so this is the statement of the intermediate value theorem and the next task is to prove this so we'll now prove the intermediate value theorem and we'll first look at the case where fa is less than or equal to fb and y is between these and later we will also consider the case when fb is less than or equal to fa and y is between these but first let's tackle the case when fa is less than or equal to fb and y is bigger than or equal to fa and less than or equal to fb so here I've drawn a picture, here is uh, where A is and here is where B is and we see that in this picture I've drawn FA which is less than or equal to FB, right? This is FA and this is FB and you have a Y which is in between FA and FB and for this Y we define a certain set which is denoted by S with the subscript Y. I put a subscript Y because this set depends on what Y was chosen. And this set is the collection of all those x's in the domain such that uh, the corresponding value of f is less than or equal to y. So sort of geometrically what we are doing is we have chosen a y, you draw a horizontal line through that and there will be some portions of the graph which maybe lie below this y and the corresponding x's, whatever you get, those are uh, constitute the set sy. Okay, so you look for example over here it turns out that this portion is below y this portion is below y so the corresponding x's which are over here these orange segments they comprise the set sy okay now what we notice about this sy is first of all it's a subset of real numbers i'm only putting in real numbers in there and sy is not empty because a belongs to sy for something to belong to sy it should be first of all a member of this compact set of course a belongs to this compact set and moreover f of a should be less than or equal to y is that true of course it is true because f of a is less than or equal to y was the assumption on the y okay so a belongs to sy so this set is not empty moreover sy is bounded above by b that's also true because what should happen is that for each element of the set that element should be less than or equal to b but in the set i am only putting those x's which are already from this compact interval so they are already less than or equal to b okay and then i am demanding something more so each x in the set is certainly going to be less than or equal to b right so b is an upper bound for this set so what i have is this set sy it's a collection of real numbers it's not empty 
and its bound in a bar. So by the least upper bound property of R, we know that it has a supremum. Supremum Sy exists. And this supremum, let me denote by C. Okay, now we are going to show that this C is in fact the point in this compact interval which is such that f of c is equal to y and we visibly see this. You see, if I take the supremum of this, that will be this point and f of c is indeed equal to y. Okay, so sort of we pictorially see this, but that's of course not a proof. So we have to prove this. So first of all, is this c an element of the compact interval? Is it bigger than or equal to a and less than or equal to b? Now this c is the least upper bound of sy. So in particular, it's an upper bound. So it's bigger than all the elements of Sy. But I know that A belongs to Sy, so C is bigger than or equal to A. Why? Because A belongs to Sy and C is a least upper bound, in particular an upper bound of Sy. So C is bigger than all the elements of Sy, in particular it's bigger than or equal to A. We also know that uh, B is an upper bound of Sy and C is the least upper bound. So of course we know that C is also less than or equal to B. Okay, so we have that C belongs to the domain of the function because it belongs to this compact interval AB, right? It's bigger than or equal to A and less than or equal to B. Our next claim is going to be that FC is equal to Y. Okay, so that's what of course we wanted to show that FC is equal to Y. Now, a useful technique of proving that two numbers are equal is to show that, uh, well, for the two numbers, both the inequalities hold in the sense that fc is less than or equal to y will show and also fc is bigger than or equal to y will show. And these two together imply that, well, there's no choice but that fc is equal to y because you cannot have a strict inequality over here because uh, this is also true and that's exactly the opposite of this by the trichotomy law. Okay, so you cannot have a strict inequality here and so there will be equality then. So what we'll show to prove that fc is equal to y is that we'll show fc is less than or equal to y and fc is bigger than or equal to y and these two together will force fc is equal to y. Okay, so let's first prove that fc is less than or equal to y. Now for any natural number n, for any natural number n, I look at the number c minus 1 by n. So this is something which is strictly smaller than the least upper bound. Remember that C was the least upper bound of Sy. So now this number is strictly less than the least upper bound. So it can't be an upper bound. Okay. So it's not an upper bound of Sy. That means there must be an element in Sy which prevents it from being an upper bound. So I denote that element by Xn. Okay. So I know that since it's preventing, preventing this from being an upper bound, c minus 1 by n is actually less than xn. Okay, So what are we doing in this step? Well, for each na uh, natural number, for example, n equal to 1, I look at c minus 1. That's not an upper bound, so there must be an element x1 in Sy such that c minus 1 is strictly less than x1. Then I take c minus half with n equal to 2. That's also not an upper bound, so there must be el exist an element x2 in Sy such that c minus half is less than x2 and so on I keep going on. So in this way I get a whole sequence x1, x2, x3 of elements in Sy which satisfy that c minus 1 by n is less than xn. Okay, so what do I have? For each n I have that this nth term is bigger than c minus 1 by n and since xn belongs to Sy, okay, we know that C is an upper bound of Sy, it's the least upper bound, in particular an upper bound. So since C is an upper bound and Xn belongs to Sy, C is bigger than or equal to Xn. So what we have got is that this nth term is flanked between the nth term of these two sequences. The sequence whose nth term is C minus 1 by n and the sequence whose nth term is C. So that's the constant sequence C, 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 C. But by the algebra of limits, we know that c minus 1 by n converges to c and this constant sequence c, 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 c converges to c. So by the sandwich theorem, it follows that this middle sequence xn converges to c. So now I know that these xn's, they belong to Sy. So of course, they are elements in the domain of the function. So you have a sequence in the domain of the function which is converging to something in the domain right 
and since the function is continuous on the whole interval it's continuous at each and every point so in particular it's continuous at this point c in the domain right so by the characterization of continuity via convergent convergence of sequences we know that since xn converges to c f of xn will converge to f of c okay so i now know that this sequence f of xn f of x1 f of x2 f of x3 and so on that is conver a convergent sequence with limit fc okay now to show this inequality i will produce this inequality for all n's and then i'll pass to the limit so that then i'll get that the limit of this is less than or equal to the limit of the constant sequence y y y which is uh, y and so you'll get that f of c is less than or equal to y okay so how do we produce this inequality well that's because of the definition of x y s y we know that for each n xn belongs to s y so what is the set s y it was all the x's such that f of x is less than or equal to y now since each xn belongs to s y f of xn is less than or equal to y so that's exactly what we have written over here right so since xn belongs to s y by the defining property of s y i know that uh, f of xn is less than or equal to y this happens with each n and so by that exercise 2.18 that we had proved namely that whenever the nth term of a sequence is less than or equal to the nth term of another sequence and both of them are convergent then the limits also obey the same inequality the limit of an is less than or equal to the limit of bn so because of that you get that the limit of this sequence is less than or equal to the limit of this constant sequence y y y which is y so since fxn converges to fc we have that f of c which is the limit of this one is less than or equal to y so we have proved fc is less than or equal to y okay so the task was to prove that fc is equal to y and we were going to prove two sets of things one is fc is less than or equal to y and fc is bigger than or equal to y and now we have done half the job now it remains to show fc is bigger than or equal to y okay so let's prove that now now if c is equal to b then we do have that y is less than or equal to fb that was the defining property of y and since b is equal to c then these two are equal so we have already got that y is less than or equal to fc so in the case when c is equal to b we are already done now let's uh, assume well if c is not equal to b the only choice you have is that c is strictly less than b so suppose now we are in the case when c is strictly less than b okay so then for every n natural number i define this uh, nth term of the sequence xn like this xn is defined by c plus b minus c by n okay now if b is strictly bigger than c you see then b minus c is a positive number n being a natural number is also a positive number so this is a positive number so this is xn is certainly bigger than strictly bigger than c and c we know is bigger than or equal to a so we know that xn is bigger than or equal to a i also show that it's less than or equal to b so each of these xn's will be in the compact interval why is it less than or equal to b well if i just look at don't touch the c then this is less than or equal to c but then this thing i overestimate because this n being a natural number is going to be bigger than or equal to 1 so its reciprocal is going to be less than or equal to 1 and b minus c is a positive number so when i multiply by b minus c the inequality is preserved so c plus b minus c divided by n is less than or equal to c plus b minus c divided by 1 but you see now the c cancels leaving a b so this xn is certainly bigger than or equal to a and less than or equal to b so it belongs to this compact interval moreover we know from the algebra of limits okay first of all this b minus c divided by n converges to 0 and so it follows that this xn converges to c right because this part is going to 0 so xn converges to c and each of these xn's belongs to the domain of the function so you have a sequence which converges to a point c in the domain and each of the terms is also in the domain then since the function is continuous at c it follows that f of xn converges to f of c okay now we will again use that earlier trick of somehow we will show that for each n 
f of xn is bigger than y and hence bigger than or equal to y and then we will pass to the limit as n tends to infinity. So how do we see that f xn is bigger than y? Well, for each n we had observed that xn is strictly bigger than c and c was the least upper bound and in particular an upper bound. Okay, so since xn is bigger than c, this xn cannot belong to sy. Okay, because uh, each element of uh, sy should be less than or equal to c because c is an upper bound. Okay, so since xn is strictly bigger than c, it cannot be in the set sy. Okay, so since it's not in the set sy, then this cannot happen for that xn. Okay, so if uh, it is not the case that fxn is strictly uh, is less than or equal to y, it must be that fxn is strictly bigger than y. So you get this, fxn bigger than y means that it's also bigger than or equal to, and this happens for each n. So again, passing to the limit as n tends to infinity, by exercise 2.18, it follows that then the limit will also obey the same inequality, and the limit of this f of xn is fc, so fc is bigger than or equal to y. Okay, so we have also proved this one. In the case when c equal to b, this was trivial, but in the case when c is strictly less than b, we have again managed to prove that fc is bigger than or equal to y. So we have got that fc is less than or equal to y and fc is bigger than or equal to y. So by trichotomy law, there is no choice but that fc has to be equal to y. Okay, so in the case when fa is less than or equal to fb, and y is in between these, we have managed to prove that there exists a point C in AB such that FC is equal to y. And how did we do this? Well, we first, given this y, defined this set. And in fact, we showed that the supremum of this set exists. And whatever that value is, if we call it C, we prove that it is in the interval. And moreover, we showed that this special uh, supremum has the property that F of C is equal to y. Okay, so we have proved the intermediate value theorem in this case when fa is less than or equal to fb. How about the other case when fb is less than or equal to fa? Now we could of course repeat the proof uh, adapted in, uh, for this case, but actually we don't have to do that because this one will follow from the first part. You see, if I multiply throughout by minus one, all the inequalities are reversed. So minus fb is bigger than or equal to minus y is bigger than or equal to minus fa. But this minus fb is really the value of the function minus f at b. So you see if you have a function f from a to uh, ab to r, then by multiplying it by, uh, by pointwise multiplying it by minus 1, the real number, you get this new function minus f from a, b to r and in the theorem on the algebra of continuous functions, if f was continuous on a, b, then we know that minus f is also continuous. Okay, But this minus f function is satisfying this, that minus f at a is less than or equal to minus f at b, exactly like over here. The value of the function at a is less than or equal to the value of the function at b. So the value of the function minus f at a is less than or equal to the value of the function minus f at b and you have some number minus y which lies in between these two values. So by part one we know that there exists a point c in the domain of this function which is still the compact interval a b such that minus f uh, the function in question which is minus f this continuous function evaluated at c is the this intermediate value in question which is minus y. But what is minus f at c? It is simply minus fc. So the minus cancels and lo and behold you have got fc is equal to y. Okay. So this alternative case when fb is less than or equal to fa you can do by going reducing this to the first case for a different function minus f. You use the first part you reach the conclusion for this new function and then somehow you just translate what was this new function. The value of this new function at c is nothing but the minus the value of the old function at c and then the minus cancels leaving the conclusion for the old function. Okay, so this proves the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so we'll now look at some applications of the intermediate value theorem. So a couple of examples. So here is the first one. Consider the polynomial p 
which is real value with real coefficients given by p of x is equal to x to the power 2021 plus x to the power 2019 plus 3x cubed minus 2x minus 1 for x's in r and we see that the leading the highest power which appears is 2021 and then uh, the corresponding coefficient is 1 which is non-zero and so this is a polynomial of degree 2021. Now our claim is that p has a 0 in this open interval 0 1. So there is a place where uh, there is a number c in between strictly bigger than 0 and strictly less than 1. So positive number strictly less than 1 uh, such that p of that c is equal to 0. Okay. So this is a typical application of the intermediate value theorem. So to show, uh, see this using the intermediate value theorem, let's uh, co consider the compact interval 0, 1 and look at the restriction of uh, this continuous function to this interval. So then we know by the theorem that we have learned is that this is also a continuous function. Okay. And we will take the value 0, y equal to 0 and we will show that well this y lies in between the value at 0 and 1 and so by the intermediate value theorem it must be attained so that's the plan so let's calculate p of 0 p of 0 will be well all these terms containing x's will vanish and only the constant term will survive which is minus 1 so that's less than 0 which we are taking as y and p of 1 on the other hand is well 1 to the power 2021 20, which is 1 plus 1 to the power 2019 which is 1 plus 3 1 cube which gives 3 minus 2 times 1 which gives this minus 2 and then minus 1. So if you calculate this, this is 1 plus 1 plus 3 which is 5 minus 2 is 3 uh, minus 1 is 2 and that's a positive number which was this y. Okay, so this y equal to 0 is uh, less than p of 1 and bigger than p of 0. Meanwhile p restricted to 0 1 is continuous. So by the intermediate value theorem the value y equal to 0 must be attained. So there is some c uh, in this compact interval such that p of c is equal to this y which is 0. right? And so we have managed to show that the, there is some c where p c is equal to 0. But this c cannot be 0 you see because p of 0 is not equal to 0. It can't be 1 either because p of 1 is 2 which is not 0. So this c cannot be the endpoint value so it is somewhere in between so this p has actually the c in fact belongs to the open interval 0 1 right and so p has a, z, a real 0 in this open interval okay now more generally if you have any polynomial with real coefficients and the polynomial has a odd degree then it must have at least one real 0 and this essentially happens because if, if the polynomial has an odd degree then actually for very large values it's only the leading term which matters and the leading term is like an odd power so if the coefficient the coefficient of this leading odd degree term odd power of uh, x is positive then for very large x's it will be positive the polynomial and for very much negative values it will be negative Okay, so somewhere it is negative, somewhere it is positive, it's a continuous function, so it has to cross zero somewhere by the intermediate value theorem and that shows the existence of a real zero. Okay, so that's the idea, but let us now prove it. So we'll now show the theorem which says that every odd degree polynomial with real coefficients has a real zero. So what we have at hand is a polynomial P with real coefficients and with an odd degree. So let the degree be 2m minus 1 where m is some natural number. For example, if the degree is 3, then m is equal to 2. If the degree is 5, m equal to 3 and so on. And these coefficients are real numbers. And since it has degree 2m minus 1, this leading coefficient is not equal to 0. And what we want to show is that this polynomial has a real 0. And we want to use the intermediate value theorem to do this. And the idea is that this polynomial for large mod x's behaves essentially as its leading term. And this leading term, you know, for x's positive and negative, it has one sign or the other, right? 
and so somewhere it has to become zero so that's the idea so we want to show that this p behaves like its leading term or looks like its leading term for large values of mod x now this is sort of intuitively clear because for example if it was a third uh, cubic polynomial of degree 3 and all the coefficients were of the order 10 then if i take x in the order of a million then you see this will be of the order 10 to the power 18 whereas the next term will be of the order 10 to the power 12 yeah so of course this is minuscule as compared to this one so to make this sort of uh, rigorous and quantitative uh, what we'll do is we'll separate out this as a factor and then we'll show that whatever is left out that behaves essentially as a constant for large values okay so we take this c 2m minus 1 times x to the power uh, 2m minus 1 this leading term over here as a common factor and then what's left is a big bracketed term this first thing will give a 1 the next one will be well this divided by this what is that well c 2m minus 2 divided by c 2m minus 1 and then this x 2m minus 2 divided by x 2m minus 1 will leave a x in the denominator and this we are doing for non-zero x's so division by x is safe and then all the way up till c 1x divided by this one will give c 1 divided by c 2m minus 1 and x divided by x 2m minus 1 will leave a x 2m minus 2 in the denominator and similarly the last term just gives c 0 divided by c 2m minus 1 x 2m minus 1 so this remainder term this rational function we denote by rx okay and we know intuitively that for large x's you know these are all small numbers so essentially it behaves like one so that's the idea so let's look at the limit of this as n tends to infinity so i look at rn i wherever i see x i put n and i look at the limit of this as n tends to infinity first of all without the limit if i just look at the nth term of the sequence that's this one and I know that 1 by n converges to 0 and so by the algebra of limits 1 by n to the power any uh, power so in particular 1 by n to the power 2 m minus 1 and 1 by n to the power 2 m minus 1 all of these converge to 0 and so by the algebra of limits this thing converges as n tends to infinity to 1 right so the limit as n tends to infinity of rn is equal to 1 similarly for mod x is large and x negative a similar thing happens so if i instead of x i put a minus n everywhere then everywhere you get minus n here you will get minus n power 2m minus 2 minus n to the power 2m minus 1 but again uh, minus 1 by n also converges to 0 so all of these will still converge to 0 so the again by the algebra of limits the limit as n tends to infinity of r minus n is equal to 1 also so basically the limit as n tends to infinity of rn and of r minus n both of them these values settle down to one okay so if i take a strip of width say half okay then we know that for large n's okay rn is going to be bigger than or equal to half and less than or equal to three by two so essentially it behaves like a constant in between these two values and we will use this okay so we know that since the limit as n tends to infinity of rn is equal to 1 uh, given this epsilon equal to half which is a positive number there exists a large enough index such that beyond that index the distance of rn to 1 is less than half and similarly there exists a n2 such that since r minus n also converges to 1 beyond this n2 the distance of r minus n to 1 is less than half and then you know if this for rn the index which achieves this if you call it as capital N1 and the one the index uh, which achieves this you call it as capital N2 you can take N to be the maximum of those two and then we have that for every little n bigger than capital N both of these are true okay so then for little n's bigger than this capital N I have that 1 minus Rn is of course less than or equal to its own absolute value which is mod rn minus 1 which is less than half and the reason i did this is then i see that rn is bigger than if i take it on this side and half on this side rn is bigger than half right which we could also see over here rn stays above this half 
Okay, so Rn is bigger than half, which is a positive number, and also R minus n similarly is bigger than one minus half, which is half, which is positive. Okay, so now for all the little n's which are bigger than this capital N, what does Pn and P minus n look like? Well, Pn is c to m minus one times uh, you know from over here. You see, px is equal to c to m minus one x to the power two m minus one times r x. So when I put x equal to n, where n is bigger than this capital N, Pn is equal to c to m minus one n to the power two m minus one times r n. And I know that for n's bigger than this thing, r n is strictly bigger than zero. So this is a positive number. This is also a positive number. So whatever is the sign of this, that's the sign which is picked up by n. So in the case when c c to m minus one is positive, this p n is positive, and if c to m minus one is negative, then this p n is negative, right? Similarly, p minus n is from over here c to m minus one uh, minus uh, n to the power two m minus one, which is minus of n to the power two m minus one, yeah, because this is an odd number, and then you have r minus n, okay. And we know that for n's bigger than this capital N, this r minus n is positive. It is in fact bigger than half, so this is positive. This is also positive, and you have an extra minus sign. So if c to m minus n is positive, this p n p minus n will be negative, and if c to m minus one is negative, then p minus n will be positive. So what have we got? We have got that when little n is bigger than capital N, if we are in this case. At p n is positive and p minus n is negative, and if c two m minus one is negative, then p n is negative and p minus n is positive. Okay, so let's use now the intermediate value theorem for the restriction of p to this interval. So I want to take a concrete n which is bigger than capital N. This is this table is true for all the little n's which are bigger than capital N. So let's just take little n to be capital N plus one. Okay, then I have that p restricted to this interval minus n plus one to n plus one is also continuous. This is a compact interval also, and moreover, p of capital N plus one. In in this case, if c to m minus one is positive, is going to be positive, and similarly p minus n plus one is negative, so it changes sign. Also, in the case when c to m minus one is negative, at one end point the value is negative, and at the other end point the value is positive. Okay, so irrespective of what c to m minus one is, this p at the end points takes opposite values, either. Positive here and negative here in C to m minus one, positive case or the flipped case when C to m minus one is negative. Okay, but it does change sign at the end points. The values have opposite sign. So by the intermediate value theorem, if you take y equal to zero, there must exist a C in this compact interval such that P C is equal to zero. And so we see that every odd degree polynomial with real coefficients has a real zero. So, as our next example, we will uh, show the following curious fact: that at any moment of time, there exist diametrically opposite points on the equator of the Earth which have the exact same temperature. So, here is the situation: here is the equator of the Earth, and you have an array of thermometers along the equator, which tells you the temperature at any longitudinal angle theta. Okay, so the longitudinal angle increases from theta equal to zero all the way up till theta equal to two pi when it is back to the same point that you began with. So this capital T describes the temperature along the equator at any moment of time. Okay, so that is a function which is defined on this compact interval zero two pi and takes real values. And then we know that T of zero is the same as T of two pi. Okay, because that's the same point after one. Revolution, and we also make the assumption that this temperature function is a continuous function. After all, the temperature from place to place changes sort of smoothly, and that's the assumption that we make. And what we want to show is that the at any moment of time there is some longitudinal angle theta, 
such that the temperature at theta and the temperature at the diametrically opposite point is exactly the same. There is some such longitudinal angle such that the temperature there and at the diametrically opposite point along the equator is exactly the same. So it makes sense to look at the following function s. Uh, so first of all, what is the, if the longitudinal angle is theta, what is the diametrically opposite point longitudinal angle? Well, you have to add to this theta an angle of pi, 180 degrees or pi radians. So then you get this point and the temperature at this point is T of the corresponding longitudinal angle which is theta plus pi. Okay, so it makes sense to define this function S which compares at any theta the temperature at theta with the diametrically opposite point. So T of theta plus pi and you know this theta can run just from 0 to pi. So for all the points over here you are comparing what is the temperature at these points with the corresponding di uh, diametrically opposite point. Okay. Now it's clear sort of that if T is changing continuously then also this S will change continuously with theta but let's uh, give a proof of that. So first of all let's look at this inner function and then T is composed with this inner function. So let's first look at the function which maps the variable theta to theta plus pi. So theta to theta is just the identity map and then you are adding to it this extra constant function. Okay, So this map which sends theta to theta plus pi where theta runs from 0 to pi and takes real values th this is of course continuous. Okay, And what is the range of this function? Well the range of this when theta runs from 0 to pi it starts at 0 so then it starts at pi this value and then when theta reaches pi it becomes pi plus pi which is 2 pi. So the range of this function f is this uh, compact interval pi to 2 pi and that is contained in the domain of t. You see t is going from 0 to 2 pi and in particular from pi to pi also it eats as uh, argument values. So you can look at the restriction of t to pi to 2 pi and then we know that the range of this is in the domain of this which is pi to 2 pi. So you can compose this continuous function and this continuous function and the result is a continuous function. Now s is nothing but the restriction of t to the co uh, compact interval 0 to pi minus this composition that I just mentioned namely t restricted to pi to pi composed with f. Why is that? Well if I feed to s any theta in 0 to pi then what will this part be? Well f of theta will be theta plus pi and that is in the domain of this function and then t, the restriction of t is just t of whatever it uh, is in front of it which is theta plus pi. So you get theta plus pi and on the other hand if theta is in 0 to pi then the restriction of t uh, to 0 to pi acting on this theta is nothing but t theta. So this s of theta is exactly this function but we know that since t is continuous its restriction is continuous and since this is also continuous f was continuous so the composition is continuous. Okay, so this s is a continuous function. Now let's look at the endpoint values of s. s of 0 is nothing but t of 0 minus t of 0 plus pi that's t pi. Similarly s at pi is t pi minus t of 2 pi but t of 2 pi is the same as t of 0 because that's one and the same point. Right? So t of uh, 2 pi is the same as t of 0. So you see that what we have got here t pi minus t 0 is exactly the negative of this one. So this is exactly minus s 0. Now if s 0 happens to be 0 then you already know that the 0 angle longitude is such that it's diametrically opposite temperature 0 because s 0 equal to 0 just means that t 0 is t pi. If s 0 is positive then s pi which is minus s0 is negative. So they have opposite values at 0 and pi. Similarly when uh, s of 0 is negative s of pi which is minus s0 will be positive. So again at, at uh, 0 and pi s takes opposite values. So by the intermediate value theorem, so in this case we were already done when s0 was 0 we know that t0 is the same as t pi. Okay, But even when uh, s0 is positive by the intermediate value theorem since the values at s0 and s pi are um, opposite in sign if I take y equal to 0 
that lies between these opposite uh, values, positive value and uh, negative value at the end point. And hence, uh, there must exist a theta star in 0 to pi such that s of theta star attains this value of 0. Okay. And uh, similarly, also when s0 is negative, you have opposite values, s of uh, 0 is negative and s of uh, pi is positive. So if I take y equal to 0, it lies between these uh, opposite uh, the values at the endpoints. And so by the intermediate value theorem, there must exist a theta star such that s of theta star is equal to 0. But what does s of theta star mean? It means that t of theta star minus t of theta star plus pi, so at the diametrically opposite point to longitude theta star, we have that the difference of these two values is zero. In other words, t of theta star is the same as t of theta star plus pi. So at any moment of time, uh, there's a pair of diametrically opposite points such that uh, along the equator, which have the same temperature. So as our next example, we will show the following, that if you have a strictly increasing and continuous function on a compact interval, then the range of this function is exactly the compact interval with the endpoints as the values of the function at the endpoint. And let's state this precisely. So you have a function f on this compact interval AB, which is real valued, and the function is strictly increasing. So whenever x is strictly less than y in its domain, then f of x is strictly less than f of y. And we also assume that the function is continuous on this compact interval. And then our first claim is that the range of this function, so this f of its domain, just means the set of all f of x's where x belongs to its domain, which is this compact interval. Okay, so this is the notation for the image. So this is a set, and that set is exactly this uh, compact interval with the endpoints fa uh, to fp. And since it's strictly increasing, we already know that fa is strictly less than fp. Okay, so this notation makes sense. And then as a corollary, we can immediately conclude that if I look at the map x to f of x with the domain as this compact interval and codomain as the range of this f, then we know that this is an onto function because anything in here is f of something uh, where that something belongs over here. So this is certainly a subjective function, it is onto. But it is also one-to-one -one because it is strictly increasing, right? Because if whenever x and y are not equal, one of them is bigger. So let's call, uh, say, y is bigger. So x is strictly less than y. But then f of x can't be equal to f of y, right? Because f of x is strictly less than f of y. Then, So uh, it is also one-to-one. -one. So it is uh, injective and surjective. So it's a bijection. So then it has an inverse map as well. Okay, so this second thing follows immediately from the first thing and the fact that it's strictly increasing. So it remains to show that the range of this function is in fact this compact interval. So that's what we want to prove. So to show that two sets are the same, we show that this is included in here and vice versa, this thing is included in this one. So let's start with the second inclusion first. So let's prove that this compact interval is contained in the range of uh, this one. So we have to show that any y you take in here is f of something where that something belongs to this compact interval. Okay, first of all, let's notice that since a is strictly less than b, f a is strictly less than f of b. So this notation makes sense because we always wanted this first thing to be strictly less than the second thing. Okay, and now if I take a y in this set, so y is bigger than or equal to f a and less than or equal to f b, then by the intermediate value theorem, it follows that this uh, value is attained. So there must exist some c in a b such that f of c is equal to y. So this y is f of something where that something belongs to this one. So in other words, it belongs to the range. So any y in here belongs in here. So we have proved uh, this inclusion that this set on the right is contained in this set on the left. Now we prove the other inclusion, that is the set on the left is included in here. So let's take any element in the range. So for any x in between a and b, okay, you have that f of x is of course bigger than or equal to f of a and less than or equal to f of b. Why is that? Because f is 
strictly increasing. So we know that since a is less than or equal to x, fa is less than or equal to f of x. And similarly, since x is less than or equal to b, fx is less than or equal to fb. So you already know this, right? So anything in the range is uh, in between fa and fb. So anything in the range belongs to this compact interval uh, from fa to fb. And so we have shown that the range is contained in here as well. So we have shown the other inclusion. And so from these two highlighted pink statements, this highlighted yellow statement follows. Okay, so we prove this using the intermediate value theorem. So as our final example, we will show that if you look at this equation, one minus x times e to the power x equal to sine x in the unknown real number x, we will show that this has a real solution which lies in this open interval 0, 1. So there is some x which is a positive number and strictly less than 1 such that this equation is satisfied. Now we will use the intermediate value theorem to do this and the way we will do this is we will first bring all the stuff to one side and look at the resulting function and show that that function has a real 0 and that 0 lies in this open interval 0 to 1. And in this exercise, we'll also accept the fact that the functions, the exponential function e to the power x and sine x, they are continuous functions on the whole of the real line. So to carry out the plan, as I just mentioned, we bring all the uh, stuff to one side and investigate the zeros of the re resulting function. So to do this, we will look at this function f, which is one minus x times e to the power x minus sine x. And since we are interested in a zero, a real solution in this interval, we'll look at the restriction of all these functions to the compact interval zero, one. Okay, so then we know that since uh, e to the power x and sine x, they are continuous on the whole real line, so are the restrictions to this interval. And then f is a continuous function because uh, one minus x is continuous and e to the power x is continuous and then we are taking that pointwise product which is uh, continuous and similarly minus sine x is also continuous and then by the algebra of continuous functions we know that this combination is a continuous function so f is continuous and now let's investigate its endpoint values and if they have uh, opposite signs then we can conclude that there's a zero of this function in this interval so let's calculate f of 0. f of 0 is 1 minus 0 times e to the power 0 minus sine 0. Now sine 0 is 0, e to the power 0 is 1 and this also gives 1. So you get 1 which is a positive number. So the value at 0 is positive. What about f of 1? Then you get 1 minus 1 times e to the power 1 minus sine 1. So this term goes away because this is 0. And then you have minus sine 1. Okay, now here I mean one radian. Now one is uh, less than pi by two. You see pi is uh, three point uh, something and then this is certainly bigger than one. And in this interval from zero to pi by two, sine is positive, right? And so we know that sine one is positive. So minus sine one is negative. So f of one has the opposite sign to what f of zero is, it is negative. So by the intermediate value theorem, if I take y as 0, then that lies in between the endpoint values. y is less than f of 0 and is bigger than f of 1. So uh, by the intermediate value theorem, there has to exist some c belonging to this compact interval such that f of c is equal to 0. But the c can't be these endpoint values 0 or 1 because f of 0 we know is 1, which is not 0 and f of 1 is minus sin 1 which is also not 0. Yeah, So c cannot be 0 or 1 so it means that it has to belong to this open interval. Okay, So there exists a c in this open interval 0 1 such that f of c is 0. But what does f of c equal to 0 mean? That means that 1 minus c e to the power c minus sin c is 0 or rearranging 1 minus c times e to the power c is equal to sin c. We have shown the existence of a uh, real number c in this open interval such that uh, this equation is satisfied. Okay, so next time what we will learn about is the extreme value theorem.